and then and then part of them is like different variety. Um, I just apologise. This isn't quite the same because Marsh might have made a bit of a faux pas. <laughs> but human mind is fallible, as we'll find out. So um, I'm a lawyer and a trainee solicitor, and so my interest in scepticism is generally things where uh, law and scepticism can combine. And I think this is one of them um, in terms of the profession. So why on earth would someone confess to something that they haven't done? It sounds it sounds really weird. Why on earth would you do that? That's actually in the news at the moment, you might have seen this, uh, this lady, um, she's a British Iranian national, and she's currently being detained in Iran. Um, not quite clear why, without charge, but she appears to have signed a confession under duress, at least that's what her family members are saying. Um, she, she, we don't know what she's confessed to, but she seems to have been forced to do it. And that's usually the kind of thing that at least comes to mind for me when I, for, when I think about it. It's normally someone who's been forced. You, the only reason that you would do it is because you've been forced to do it. You know, um, or if, because you're under duress, you've been tortured or something like that by dictators and things like that. That's normally the first thing that would come to mind for me. But there's actually lots of other reasons, but before I get to that, I'm going to give you a little bit of a memory test, a listening test, okay? Don't worry about it, it's not very long. You've been warned about it in advance. You've only got to remember it for five minutes, all right? So, imagine this, is a, this was a story in the paper today. Last night, officers found three victims from an apparent murder in a flat in the city centre. The apparent victims of gangland-style slaying and possibly the victims of gang-related violence. Police are currently investigating it as a possible murder-suicide, but it is currently believed that the three were killed by the same individual. No suspects have yet been identified in the slaying, but officers are currently said to be seeking to speak to an off-duty soldier who was seen in the area. The bodies, which were found by a caretaker about 8 in the morning, appear to have been killed in the previous evening sometime between midnight and 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay. That's it. That's all you've got to remember. So, Reason that people confess. Does anyone know who this is? No? This is Charles Limburg Jr., uh, otherwise known as the Limburg baby. Um, in 1932, um, this baby was kidnapped um, from his parents, Charles Limburg, who was a famous aviator in 1932. And it was a massive story in America at the time, because um, Charles Limburg was quite a famous person. And they got lots of letters um, asking for ransom um, for the return of the baby. And the investigation went on for two months where they were trying to locate the, the, the people had paid, they were happy to pay the ransom, they were very wealthy, but in, during the investigation over 200 people came forward and said they had kidnapped the Limburg baby, um, which caused the police no end of, of problems when they were trying to investigate it. And now, and in the end, unfortunately, two months after um, the baby went missing, the body of the baby was found in, in the grounds of the estate, they had been murdered by whoever had, had taken it, unfortunately. But that showed that all those people had had, had, had confessed to something they hadn't done, and it, it didn't really make sense as to why they had done it. And, and when I looked into it, generally speaking, it was more that they were so it was because it was such a big story. They wanted to be part of the story, and so they they they, found, they thought confessing would be one, one way to do that. Which sounds a bit strange, but 200 people did it, so it's not it wasn't that unusual. It wasn't that unusual at the time. And, and there are other examples of people confessing to things for similar reasons. But that's not the only reason why someone would voluntarily confess to something. Other kind of people who confess are young people. Does anyone know who that is? Who is it, Karen? Brendan Dassey. Brendan Dassey, yeah. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about his specific case because I'd rather you watch the documentary Making a Murderer. He's a protagonist in that. But the, the point is that he's 16 years old. That's a, a still from a videotape of an interview of him. And um, during the course of that interview, not an original statement comes out of his mouth and he is fed things. The, off, the investigating officer suggests things to him about what's happened in it as a rape and a murder. And he, after, initially he's like, no, no, I don't know anything about this, I don't know anything about this. But then gradually he starts agreeing with the things that the officers are saying. And by the end of it, he has confessed to a rape and a murder. But it's clear that he doesn't understand the, um, the gravity of what he has done because at the end of the, of the interview, he, um, he asks them when he's going to get to go home because he's got an assignment he needs to do for school the next day. Um, not realising the fact he's confessed to a rape and a murder means he's not going home, obviously. And um, that demonstrates what happens a lot of time with young people. Luckily, not so much in this country because you will almost always have a lawyer and at least an appropriate adult. But for children, um, time, time can, they, they can, can sort of experience time slightly differently and the pressure of being in an interview can cause them to be in a situation where they need to find the quickest way out of that situation. And that will often be confessing to something. I've seen transcripts of, of interviews with children which literally say, where the child has said, what do I need to say to get out of this room? And then they've said it, and then they've confessed to something. So that's one example of where people were forced to confess to things. And it's slightly related to that because uh, Brendan unfortunately had learning difficulties, people who aren't sick, they're mentally ill. 
Does anyone know who this is? No one listening to me. Um, this is Stur Bergvall, who's also known as, Tom, known as Thomas Quick. And in the 1990s in Sweden, he was in a psychiatric um, hospital. He committed an armed robbery. And um, but he also appeared to be suffering from psychosis. So he was then getting therapy whilst he was in hospital. And the more that he gave details of things about the things, the crimes he had committed in the past, the more attention he got from the psychologist, the more therapy that he got, and he liked that attention, he started confessing to more serious things. He started confessing to murders. And the more he confessed to, the more attention he got. And in the end, he ended up confessing to 30 murders in Sweden, basically every unsolved murder in Sweden. And that's amusing, but he actually got convicted of eight of them, um, based purely on the fact that he confessed to them, purely for the attention that he received from his vulnerability. And it wasn't until around 2002, uh, 2008, sorry, when he got um, from proper uh, psycho psychological care and, and proper medication that he realised what was they realised what was going on. He recanted all of his um, confessions, and then he um, luckily he was exonerated of all the ones he had been convicted of, and he was allowed to leave. He actually, he, he, he's free. He lives out and about. He's fine. Um, and so that's another reason that people can possibly confess of vulnerabilities like that and this gentleman also suffered from vulnerabilities like that. Does anyone know who this is? Stefan Kitschko. Yeah. Yeah. Stefan Kitschko, yes. Um, you've seen him already, so you don't know. This is Stefan Kitschko. Now, I don't need to tell uh, an audience in Liverpool to we come from the Hillsborough inquest that the police are capable of lying. Um, we all know that they are. But what happens a lot more often sometimes is that they become become very blinkered in their thinking, especially when there's a high profile um, crime um, or a horrible, particularly horrible crime, for example, the murder of a child, where there's a lot of pressure for them to catch the person, to catch the killer, and therefore if they get any, a little inkling that it might be a particular person, they suddenly completely focus on that person and, and they can start forgetting and muddling up things that have been asked and turn it into a confession without them doing anything wrong. Stefan Kitschko was suspected of being uh, the murderer of Leslie Morsi, Leslie Ann Morsi, who was an 11 year old girl in the 1970s. And the reason that he came to the attention of the police is because, first of all, some teenage girls um, said that he had exposed themselves, himself to them, which was a complete lie, um, which uh, they, later, they later said was. But that was enough for the police to go and talk to him, because it was a horrible crime. And they also noticed that there was a few little odd things about Stefan. He, he had some strange habits, like he liked to record all of the uh, license plates of cars that he saw, and, and strange things like that, so they thought, you know, he's exposed himself to these girls, and he's really odd, so he definitely, it's got to be him. And so they and interrogate him excessively and they start um, and it wasn't all properly recorded because this was before the Police and Criminal Evidence Act and they started mixing up the questions that had been asked and it started to look like he had been contradicting himself and things and they hammered him for it and eventually under the under all the duress at the time he was investigated he confessed as well now at the time he confessed there was already a sculptory evidence because there was semen found on the, on the victim that contained sperm as the most semen does but uh, Mr. Kitchko had a condition that meant there was no sperm in his semen, so he could have been exonerated straight away. But the police didn't actually give the defence team that evidence. They, they didn't know about that. Also, his defence team were rubbish. They didn't believe him, and so they've had, terror they've had two contradictory defences at the same time, and he got convicted. Um, now, he was released 16 years, 17 years later, in the late 80s, um, but and by that time, he was very unwell, but he'd been attacked several times in prison because child rape, rapist murderers are the worst of the worst in the hierarchy of, of people in prison. And um, he died only a couple of years later of a heart attack at the age of 41, which is horrible. Um, but it demonstrates the fact that with the police, even if the police are completely well-intentioned and you are completely innocent and you, and you, don't, say, you don't utter a word of a lie, things can go wrong. Turns you back to protect. Remember? Well, not long ago. Start with, start with some easy ones, alright? Just start with some easy ones. Easy way. Question one. How many people were found shot in the city centre of Parliament that I told you about five minutes ago? Anyone think it's one person? Anyone think it's two people? Anyone think it's three people? Does anyone think it's four people? Does anyone think that there's no one else? Why is that, Tom? I don't remember being told they were shot. Mm -hmm. Yes, all, so all those people put their hands up. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't tell you that they'd been shot. I said gangland, I said violence, you could maybe imply things from that. But I didn't say shot. But you seem to know they were shot. 
the fire station. <laughs> <laughs> I think you better come down to the station. No, this. So that's just a demonstration of how that was only five minutes. You've not been under duress, you've not been interrogated for hours, you're not under pressure, and you're still in the space of five minutes have so managed to convolute that, that statement. And that can happen to the police themselves. You could have a conversation with a policeman in the back of the police car where he tells you that someone's been shot, but that part's not recorded. Then you have a recorded interview where he says, we're investigating a murder, do you know anything about it? To which you respond, I didn't shoot them, I've never, I've never touched a gun in my life, which on its, on its face is a completely innocent statement. In the courtroom, that statement gets read out to the police officer and he says, and the, and the, the defence barrister says, Is there, was there anything that struck you about that statement as odd, P.C. Smith? P.C. Smith says, yes, I never said he was shot. And suddenly that's really in incriminating, even though, you know, it was a completely innocent statement and, and completely true. And, and so that is a, 